the western coast of Newfoundland. A remote and scenic wonder along the sheltered waters of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Peering into the pages of geological history and exploring one of North America's great wildlife frontiers. The coastlines here have it all. The magical wonders of Grossmoor National Park. The rocks and the fossils of Grossmoor National Park tell a story of ancient life on this planet and how the Earth really works. The discovery of some of the earliest human remains on the North American continent. What keeps people here today, the marine resources, is what brought people here 6,000 years ago. And a century-old animal symbol on this remote island. There's now over 120,000 uh, moose on the island of Newfoundland, and yes, they have become an iconic animal. People get very excited when they see them. Now, we explore this rugged coastline like never before. A bird's eye view, unlocking the secrets of our maritime past, present, and future. This is Canada, over the edge. High above the island of Newfoundland, the town of Stephenville marks the beginning of a journey along this remote coastline. Set in the sheltered northeast corner of Bay St. George, Stephenville was settled by French Acadians more than 150 years ago, fishing and farming along this barren shoreline. Today, it is the regional hub for the southwest corner of the island, home to more than 25,000 people. Adjacent to the town lies a remnant of Newfoundland's military past. Stephenville's airport sits on the former site of the United States Ernest Harmon Air Force Base. With its 10,000-foot runway, Stephenville was one of the few alternate landing sites for the space shuttle along the east coast of North America. Heading west, the remote Porto Port Peninsula is one of Newfoundland's scenic and cultural gems. Connected to the larger island by a thin strip of land, Porto Port is Newfoundland's only bilingual region. with a French Roman Catholic presence that has flourished here for centuries. The French shore, as it was known, 
remained under French influence until 1904, when France gave up settlement rights on this coast. Today, Porto Port is a mix of scenic villages and industry. Here, on the southern shore of the peninsula, limestone quarries have operated for more than a century. With a billion metric tons of limestone buried deep underground, the facility has a long lifespan Today's operation extracts more than two million tons of material each year. Further west, Porto Port Peninsula ends at Cape St. George. With a stunning towering array of limestone, shale, and sandstone cliffs. Heading east along the peninsula's northern coast, one of the region's most scenic roadways leads 75 kilometers back to the main island. Here, more cliffs, rocky shoreline, and incredible sandbars make Porto Port one of the Southwest's great untouched wonders. Next, we head north. From the cliffs of the Porto Port Peninsula to one of the world's most unique mountain ranges. Here on Newfoundland's western coastline. From the coastal outpost of Stephenville and the Porto Port Peninsula, we continue north, exploring the rapidly rising coast along Newfoundland's western perimeter. Inland, a late summer sun slowly burns a shroud of mist off the green western hillsides. 
revealing an incredible mountain chain. These are the Lewis Hills, the southernmost portion of Newfoundland's long-range mountains. Extending from Stephenville in the south to the far reaches of the secluded northern peninsula. With scattered boulders and vast flat plateaus, the Lewis Hills seem of another world. Hidden amongst these towering plateaus sits the Cabo. At 815 meters, the highest point in the province. Further north, set against the Gulf of St. Lawrence, Blow Me Down Provincial Park rises abruptly, more than 600 meters from the sea. Local legend claims the park's name was born when a sea captain dropped anchor at the foot of these mountains. Standing just over four feet tall, the captain uttered what would become a famous phrase. His hope that these mountains don't blow me down. Inland and back to civilization. This is the city of Cornerbrook. Nestled between the mountains and the sea. Originally four separate communities, the fishery, railway, business, and pulp and paper districts would amalgamate in the 1950s. Today, with just over 25,000 people, Cornerbrook is the largest city in western Newfoundland. Pulp and paper continues to be the heart of the community. With the industry controlling more than three million acres of forest across the province. It is one of the largest economic forces in the region.
But Corner Brook's biggest feat may be its perseverance in the face of economic hardship. It holds the unique distinction of being Canada's oldest city of its size. Populations between 25 and 75,000 people. With others either growing into major cities or fading into oblivion. Heading back to sea, the Humber River leads from Corner Brook to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. In the distance, the sensibly named estuary, the Bay of Islands. generations, these islands, with names like Pearl, Tweed, and Guernsey, were home to West Coast fishing families. Today, the many islands and fjords are an attraction for kayakers and explorers. One of the top outdoor attractions on the western coast. And it marks the gateway to even more scenic wonders. From the Bay of Islands, we continue to one of North America's best kept mountain secrets. Gros Morne National Park. Continuing north along Newfoundland's western coastline. With territorial disputes between the French and English extending into the 20th century, this was one of the last corners of North America to see permanent settlement. Even today, the region is sparsely populated. With temporary winter fishing shelters lining the coast. North of the Bay of Islands, the Newfoundland perimeter rises along Cape St. Gregory. Here, massive cliff faces foreshadow incredible geological wonders. 
along these northern reaches of the Appalachian mountain chain. Rising up, vast plateaus stretch as far as the eye can see. Far below, Trout Pond marks the entrance to the East Coast's scenic gem. Gross Morne National Park. Here, Gross Morn's famous tablelands mark one of the only places in the world where the Earth's mantle is fully revealed. Normally buried kilometers underground, here it has been forced to the surface by tectonic plate movement over millions of years. The result is a barren, desert-like landscape with little vegetation or human contact. Beyond the tablelands, Gross Morn continues stretching more than 1,800 square kilometers. Centered around the Gross Morn mountain itself, this has become a pilgrimage for hikers and explorers all over the world. It is a unique region with a unique geology. A landmark that became recognized in Canada in 1973 with the formation of a park, now famous around the world. Grossmore National Park is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is one of those special places in Canada that reveals the story of how the earth works. Fred Shepard is a park interpreter, revealing the secrets of Gross Morn to visitors from around the world. 
You had two ancient continents, Gondwana land and Laurentia, coming together 500 million years ago, forming the supercontinent of Pangaea. Pangaea sat like that for several million years. And then maybe about 250 million years ago, Pangaea started to split apart. And North America and South America and Greenland and Europe started to form and separate. So you got ancient parts of old continents and oceanic crust and upper mantle rock now jumbled in this whole landscape. So the rocks and the fossils of Grossmore National Park tell a story of ancient life on this planet. And it's one of those special places on the planet where you can come and visit and walk on ancient ocean floor, walk on the Earth's upper mantle, and get an appreciation of how spectacular this landscape is. It is a landscape that gives scientists a rare view into Earth's mysterious geological timeline. So you look at those rock layers and look at those fossils and each one of those layers tells a story. It's like a story of an old ancient book and each page reveals a different plot line in that story. And geologists can go and, and look at those individual pages and read the plot lines from those individual pages based on the fossils that are found in those rock layers. So you think about, you know, tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanic activity, those are all based in that plate tectonic theory, the theory of how the continents shift and move around the surface of the Earth. Well, 500 million years ago, that plate tectonic activity helped to form this landscape here in Grossmore National Park. And this landscape is constantly changing. But for Shepard, the mystery of Gross Morn cannot be studied on paper. It is a living wonder that must be seen to be believed. People come here because it's a special place. It's a journey. It's a journey for them to come to a wild part of our country, uh, a, a, a national park that doesn't see a, a, a lot of visitors. Sure, we get 175,000 visitors approximately every year. But that's not a lot of visitors. People come here and they realize that they can hike on a trail or go uh, into the landscape and be left alone in the landscape. Heading west, Green Gardens is Gross Morn's coastal attraction. Leading north from the Tablelands, it is a five kilometer long stretch of shoreline. With hiking trails and beaches, set against rough seas, volcanic rock formations, and scenic coves and inlets. And the hillsides here are alive with wildflowers and local livestock roaming free. Next, we head inland as the wonders of Gross Morn continue. With the fjords and cliffs of Western Brook Pond, and 
the story of this island's most famous but unlikely symbol. From the southern communities of Newfoundland's western coastline, we continue north along the barren, untouched wonders of the Tablelands to Grossmourne Mountain and beyond. Next is Baker's Brook Pond. Set inland, it is actually a series of ponds connected to a larger lake. With incredible cliffs and popular trails, this area is a top destination for hikers and cross-country skiers. Further, Big Level is one of the park's many famous plateaus with shattered rock and boulders stretching for miles. With elevation reaching as high as 800 meters, the Grossmorn region has a unique ecosystem From the lush lowlands to soaring plateaus, more than 1,000 plant species flourish. And here, in the plateaus, cooler, windier, and moist conditions give these hills a unique look. An Arctic tundra landscape, accustomed to a short and harsh growing season. And unbelievably, high in these hills, secluded from civilization, one of the world's most incredible animals roams. It is the mighty moose, an unlikely symbol of this island. Well, it's interesting because moose aren't a native animal to uh, Newfoundland. Uh, they were brought here by the Newfoundland government in 1878 and 1904. The original introductions consisted of only three pair of moose. The uh, moose were uh, let go by the uh, provincial government and they were told to uh, go forth and multiply. The moose seemed to have taken that directive pretty seriously. There's now over 120,000 uh, moose on the island of Newfoundland and yes, they have become an iconic animal. A century after their introduction, moose have become part of the landscape here, with one moose for every four people on the island. Visitors come here from around the world to share in this spectacle. They're a very impressive animal to see. We're talking about an animal that's two meters high at the shoulder. It's the size of a large draft horse, a, a Belgian or a Clydesdale, and a big uh, bull moose with his uh, big rack of antlers. It is a very impressive animal, the sort of monarch of the uh, boreal forest, uh, the classic uh, northern uh, forest deer. Um, they're very impressive to see, and people get very excited when they see them. And here in Newfoundland, with such an abundant population, you do sometimes see them uh, right along on the roadside, you don't necessarily have to go uh, tramping around the woods.
But for residents here, the moose is more than a symbol. It has been a stable part of the diet here for decades. They were introduced as an extra food supply for Newfoundland residents, and it was at a time when the uh, native caribou herds had uh, been hunted very heavily with uh, commercial hunting and all that sort of thing. So the, they were brought here as an extra food supply for local residents. And uh, in a way, the conditions were perfect for a uh, moose population explosion because uh, man had eliminated their major uh, predator, the uh, Newfoundland wolf, um, shortly after the introduction of the uh, moose. Certainly uh, today, we're talking about somewhere around 26, 27,000 moose licenses issued every fall. Almost all the uh, hunters are successful. And uh, a lot of uh, people in rural Newfoundland especially uh, depend on uh, getting their moose for their uh, winter supply of meat. And it's a very important part of the way of life here in uh, Newfoundland. And with the population explosion of the animal here, drivers all over the island know to watch out for this formidable creature. With 700 collisions between motorists and moose recorded each year. Certainly, if you're on the go early in the morning or late in the evening, you want to be really careful when you're driving down the road and keep your eye out for a moose because they do often feed in the roadside ditches and they have a nasty habit of just popping up onto the road in front of your car without any uh, warning. And especially in uh, times of low light conditions early in the morning and late in the evening, when I'm driving down the road, I often uh, sort of, I, I've got my uh, eyes kind of halfway tuned to the ditches. And if I happen to see a bit of a glint of light coming from the uh, ditch, that's my headlights bouncing off the uh, moose's eyeballs and sometimes that gives me the clue that I had uh, better uh, be ready to slam on the brakes. Next, Gross Morn's signature attraction is Western Brook Pond. It is a freshwater fjord with stone walls more than 600 meters high. Carved by glaciers tens of thousands of years ago. As glaciers in the region melted, the land, once forced down by the weight of the ice, rose to incredible heights. Western Brook's connection to the sea was cut off and the 30 kilometer long pond was slowly replaced by fresh water. It is a natural wonder with water so fresh it is categorized as ultra oligotrophic, the top purity rating for fresh water in the world. And high above, Western Brook's signature attraction, the uniquely named Pissing Mare Falls, the highest waterfall in eastern North America. Next, we continue north as the high coastal plateaus of Gros Morne are replaced by lowlands and geological mysteries become cultural mysteries. High above North America's earliest human settlements.
From the coastal geological wonders of the south, we've covered more than 150 kilometers of incredible perimeter along Newfoundland's western coastline. Now, the last few miles along this aerial journey. At the upper reaches of Grossmoor National Park, this is St. Paul's Inlet, a saltwater bay featuring 35 kilometers of scenic shoreline. Popular with kayakers and bird enthusiasts, the fishing and logging industries here have been gradually replaced by tourism with the formation of the adjacent national park. Next, Cowhead. This area has seen settlement since the 1800s, the site of a strong herring, cod, and salmon fishery. And the site of Newfoundland's first offshore oil project in 1867. An industry today that is worth billions of dollars annually. Further north, the mountains recede, and the vast plateaus are replaced by rocky, jagged East Coast coastline. This is the gateway to Newfoundland's northern peninsula, a 200-kilometer stretch of barren beauty. Here, tides and time have left a legacy of incredible geological formations. This is the Arches Provincial Park, a massive block of limestone separated from the seashore by centuries of crashing waves. Over time, the inner caverns have eroded, leaving the arches we see today. It is an attraction for visitors throughout the region, walking beneath these rock openings, or simply taking in the power of the sea. Next, the Table Point Ecological Reserve. While this stretch of coast is home to diverse animal and plant life, the Table Point Reserve is for the protection of fossils. An incredible collection of ancient sea lilies, sponges, and sea creatures 
dating back hundreds of millions of years. Continuing north, a return to civilization. From the village of Daniels Harbor to River of Ponds, Far removed from the island's main population centers, the few hundred residents here rely on the fishery for sustenance. Beyond River of Ponds lies one of Newfoundland's culturally historic gems, the town of Port au Choix. We're uh, about midway up the northern peninsula, and uh, we're at 51 degrees latitude, which would be the same latitude as London, England. The main industry here is fishing. Uh, Port au Choix is a very uh, lucrative area for the fishery. Porto Chois's legacy goes back thousands of years, as this unlikely outpost was one of the first documented human settlements in North America. Millie Spence is site supervisor for Porto Chois National Historic Site. What's so interesting about Porto Chois is our cultural history. That dates back uh, about 6,000 years. This area was occupied by various groups of people. First of all, uh, the uh, maritime archaic tradition, which are descendants of the first people ever to enter the New World. Uh, these people entered the New World about 12,000 years ago, and they arrived, their descendants arrived here in Port Chois around 6,000 years ago. But that wasn't the end. Uh, there were other successive uh, cultures uh, called Paleo-Eskimos that came here, and uh, they uh, came to a site uh, called Phillips Garden, and archaeologists continue today to excavate this particular site. But it is the unique geology of the region that has preserved evidence used by scientists thousands of years later. What's so unique about it is the preservation. If you look around our landscape, you'll notice there's a, a lot of limestone. And it's the uh, limestone, actually, that uh, work very well to preserve these cultures. Cultures that, in other areas, uh, there would not have been any evidence survived after five or 6,000 years. But in Port Chois, we had great bone preservation. And from that, archaeologists have been able to study bones, uh, any material, to learn more about the cultures, what they were doing here. And while the west coast of Newfoundland has changed dramatically over the years, many facets of life remain unchanged. One of the things they found here is that what keeps people here today, the marine resources, is what brought people here 6,000 years ago. Uh, these resources uh, are very rich off our area, mostly uh, sea mammal, uh, seals, for example. They came here hunting the seals. Uh, they come up through the Strait of Belle Isle twice a year, every spring like clockwork. They come to port and the Dorset people, for example, would have uh, come on a, on a seasonal basis for about 700 years hunting seals. Today, our local hunters hunt seals in this area as well. Just miles from Porto Chois, Point Rich marks land's end. This barren headland is lined by limestone seashore and home to an array of wildlife. 
and it is the site of the historic Point Rich Lighthouse. A 19-meter pepper pot design warning station built in 1892. Protecting travelers along these active shipping lanes. From Grossborn to Port O'Schwab, the western coast of Newfoundland is a natural and cultural wonder. Revealing the secrets of our geological past and the earliest clues to human civilization. Its diversity of life and breathtaking beauty will carry it into the future. Here on the edge of Canada. <laughs>